but I don't I really don't have any regrets I really don't I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to I've tried my hardest every single time I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won or but I really gave it my all so that for me is enough Hello everybody, my name is Jonathan. And I'm James. Welcome to Season 9 of The Body Serve. Season 9? Season 9, yeah. Wow. 287 episodes now, is that what this is? Yep. Uh, we had hoped to start the season earlier, but we got thrown a little bit of a, what's the word? An, uh, an obstacle. Two weeks ago today. A first time for everything. We got covid that was fun. I tested positive on Christmas Day, uh -huh. so that, that was nice. But Christmas was, what, a Sunday? I tested positive Thursday night, and then I sequestered myself. Yes. And then it was almost a relief when you tested positive. Well, it's like, how long can I wear this damn mask in the house? And we, you know, our place is not massive, uh -huh. so living separately was difficult. But you know what? It happens. Shit happens. It could have been worse. It definitely could have been worse. But that kind of wrecked our off-season plans to prepare for Season 9. We've yeah. been talking a lot about this Serena episode that, spoiler alert, still has not arrived. You know, at this point, I think she's going to unretire before we put out this episode. <laughs> but we usually like to open seasons with kind of a more long-form, uh, not super timely episode that we've put a lot of thought into and done some research. This episode will be more topical, mm -hmm. more time sensitive, and I guess we'll see what people prefer, honestly. No, we do no. both. That's what we do. <laughs> it's just that we couldn't do it this season. This episode will function as a coupling of what's going on right now, as well as a, an, a, a truncated season preview for the actual tennis. Yes. So uh, forgive us because we are still recovering from the dread COVID. We may not make sense. Our voices may not sound uh, in peak form. The other thing that sucked about having our our preparation messed up is that we are running a GoFundMe campaign. And so we had all this stuff that we wanted to be doing, you know, to keep the campaign going in people's mind's eye. And that that too was interrupted. But we're still doing it. It's still going on, in case you're wondering. <laughs> the intent was always to have it run through till the end of the Australian Open, which is what we've done with our prior GoFundMes. Currently, we are at, I believe, a little over 85% of our goal. A bit of an update with that. You may have noticed if you looked at the GoFundMe webpage that initially there were, I guess, prizes that we were awarding. That is no longer on the actual website because... It's, a few weeks ago, we were suspended. We were suspended. Well, very briefly, GoFundMe does not allow sweepstakes, giveaways, etc. So, uh, how do we say this? There were tiers <laughs> of if you donated seventy five, one fifty, and two fifty, certain things that would have been, you know, arriving to you. Yes. So officially. Officially, those were taken down, but if you donated based on, you know, those things that are forbidden, have no fear. We still want you to send us your address. Put it that way. If you yes. donated 75 and above, 150 and above, 250 and above, send us your addresses ASAP. If you donated previously and you sent us an address, just shoot us a message to say, hey, it's the same address because we have it on file. I feel like this has also been one of the shorter off-seasons and definitely the shortest periods of preparation for the tennis players for the Australian Open, don't you think? Yeah. I was, I definitely thought we had more time to plan out a couple episodes before the Australian Open, but this will be the only one before our preview mm. episode. Well, last year the Australian Open was delayed, uh, I believe a week, and... In previous years, there was no United Cup, of course. So a lot of the top players were doing the Mubadala thing mm -hmm. at the end of December, like around New yeah. Year's. But it wasn't an official tournament. But this year, you had players playing a professional sanctioned tournament days before New Year's Eve. And that was considered the 2023 tennis season. 
wishing them luck because I don't know about that. It was a very gradual onboarding, to use um, terminology from your profession. <laughs> yeah. It was a very gradual uh, and tepid onboarding for me, dipping tepid. my toes into the tennis waters this That's season. such a good word. A tentative, perhaps? <laughs> uh, reticent? Uh, one of the things that I did while I had half my mind on the tennis was to do a name the tennis player. And I, I checked the hashtag on Twitter, and this thing goes back all the way to the start, to like 2015. And, and probably before the start of the podcast. So I was like, well, you know, I'm going to do one. And I did it on Twitter. So if you've played along on Twitter, this is not going to be new for you. But as I explained to you, we have listeners who aren't on Twitter. So this may be new to them as mm-hmm, well. Mm-hmm. And for new listeners who've never done a name the tennis player before how it works is that i give you five clues and you're supposed to guess which tennis player it is ideally you're able to guess what each clue means specifically to that tennis player that's that's how you truly win this game and so the five clues are first aid bear b-a-r-e you make fun of me constantly about how i pronounce many different words that sound like that Mm -hmm. i i can't talk because where i come from our vowels are terrible but i love the way the jamaicans switch the beer and bear vowel Mm -hmm. anyway it's bear Mm b-a-r-e third clue is absurd fourth clue is crybaby cry (laughs) and lastly plaid P-L-A-I-D. So the five clues, first aid, bear, absurd, crybaby, and plaid. We're not going to give you the answer now. You have time to sit with it, write it down, troubleshoot it. At the end of the episode, we'll explain what each of those clues mean and who the tennis player is. Also, if you want to play this game and go back into the archives, just go to Twitter and search hashtag name the tennis player. There's a whole bunch of them there. To start the year, you've asked us to think about things to keep an eye out for in the 23 season. And Mm -hmm. we are always saying we're a non-prediction podcast, Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'll break the rules here because this was actually a fun exercise. Well, I wasn't thinking of it as predictions, just things to look out for. Like things that could happen. Could happen, that you kind of expect to happen, that maybe you don't want to happen. And here, this is sight unseen for us. The three segments on this episode where we have themes and questions that we ask of each other the other has not seen the answer right you've asked me to write down three so i'll read mine first just you know you read one oh i don't want you to go through and spoil one that i really want to talk about here okay my first thing to look out for two more members of the big four retiring this year and i'm not going to say who they are But I do feel strongly that two of them will retire. You're thinking Murray and Rafa, clearly. Well, probably. But you never know. I mean, Djokovic will play and will try to win majors until he can literally no longer walk. But you never know. Like, unpredictable things happen all the time in sport. Mm -hmm. The first one that I want you all to keep an eye out for in 2023, where, if at all... Will Camila Georgie pop up next? Where will <laughs> the Georgie syndicate pop up next? Prison. <laughs> this time, I, I think she's really done it. The whole family did it. This is crazy. <laughs> it's not just it's not just that she did it. Apparently, the entire family did it. Yeah. And yeah. what did they do, James? They allegedly... We don't know that they did anything. They're under investigation. For allegedly falsifying COVID vaccine passports. Mm -hmm. Camila, in order to travel and play tennis. To travel and win the National Bank Open. Wow. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Do you think that they would strip that title? I don't know. That was 2021, right? I believe so. And Canada was still under a vaccine mandate at that time. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. Guys... We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's one of your things to look out for. Yeah, when is she going to show up? Because that has a direct relationship with like her international fugitive status. (laughs) 
Yeah, you know what? Let's talk about it now. I have a, oh, an yeah. agenda item later on. But just to for clarity, uh, this was reported in several Italian newspapers, including La Repubblica of Rome. The Giorgi family, uh, Camilla is the important figure here for the tennis world, is under investigation for allegedly using fake COVID vaccine documents. And this has been tied to uh, several doctors in Vicenza, who uh, one of whom was actually arrested, thrown in jail, and then released. But those doctors are under investigation for doing the same thing. Mm. Apparently there were three doctors and only one of them is squealing. The other two mm. are not Interesting. chatting about it. Wow, it's like Jen Shah's assistant number one. <laughs> Ooh, her sentencing is this week. It's January 6th. It's tomorrow. It? Yeah, it's tomorrow. Oh, well, a fateful day in the Salt Lake City universe. Several, you know, co-stars of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City were at January 6th. Did you know that? Well, I know about the one from Salt Lake, <laughs> yes, yeah. A minor. Angie, right? No, not Angie. Who? Don't besmirch <laughs> Angie's name any further. There's already enough. I just about... know it was a white blonde lady. It was another lady who looked like Angie. Okay. In the first season. Anyway, the as you said... The brothers, the mom, the dad, Sergio, all implicated in this vaccine investigation. This crime actually carries a prison term in Italy because it's falsifying government documents. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I, I googled Camila Giorgi, Google News to her, and all of the first things that come up is like sleazy Instagram newspapers pictures. and internet sites about her new lingerie photos. Yes. Like, this is genius. She really has a gift. I'm Not to say that lingerie photos are sleazy. I, I'm not, like, shaming that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that the the outlets themselves oh. are sleazy. I seem to recall you did me dirty on this podcast when I referred to Sabalenka's pictures as, what, what was it? Body or... <laughs> what was the that word? That may have been the word, yeah. Body, racy, something like that. Because I, I said it carried a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. In a way, I'm kind of surprised that we haven't had this specific scandal break until now. Yes, I am very surprised. That said, if you had put forth a list of five tennis players who would have committed this crime allegedly, I would have expected Georgie to be well, one of them. Okay, so I went back and listened to a segment from an episode we did in 2016 called Doubles, Debtors, and Divas. Georgie was the debtor. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when the Italian Federation kicked her off the Fed Cup team because she allegedly owed around $300,000 for training, you know, various investments. About... All over Europe. Yeah, and that was two years after John Wertheim's expose about the many debts across many continents that the Georgie family supposedly owed. We're talking like the tens of thousands of dollars to a lot of people who invested in Camila's career. Allegedly, again, supposedly, but this was reported on by a legitimate news source and a legitimate reporter. For better or for worse, whether it's deserved or not, the Georgie family carries with it quite the reputation for uh, scammery. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's not Sib one scam, it's another. Right. I remember Sybil Kova allegedly, you know, pushed over some old people and knocked them down to get first in line for the COVID vaccine. This is a different. <laughs> this is a different level. Faking a vaccine passport. I just may want to talk about for a moment why this is so sick. Mm -hmm. Like why this is so unethical. Because first of all, a lot of people got the vaccine against their wishes, against their better judgment, so they could go and play. Novak Djokovic, who I do not agree with, but had at least the moral certitude to not get the vaccine, not fake it, and miss out on opportunities. Well, all that is cancelled out by the Australia saga last year. Like, he gets no <laughs> points for me. No, no. I'm just saying, I do think this rises to a to sort of a different level because you are anti-vax and you're willing to lie and scheme mm -hmm. and risk potential criminal prosecution to go and do your job. Yeah. So what is your second thing that we should be looking out for in 2023? Mm. Uh, this one is not exactly a happy one. I think 
Uh, unfortunately, we should look out for another major domestic violence scandal. I, and I, I really do not mean to be flippant at all, but based on the patterns over the past few years on the ATP, it's almost an inevitability. Well, damn. My second one was keep an eye out for if the ATP ever gets around to releasing findings of this Zverev investigation. Oh, so that was my second one. Similar. We're on a similar wavelength, wavelength there. And then today, John Wertheim tweeted, Have we, as a tennis community, done enough to note that an entire Netflix series can be produced and released in less time than it is taking the ATP tour to accumulate and release the findings of this Zverev investigation? Well, I'm glad to see John tweeting about this. I think it's important. I was encouraged by a lot of the quote tweets. They weren't uh, uniformly negative. But yeah, in the absence of anything from the ATP, people are going to make up their own conclusions. People are going to assume that the investigation is not being treated seriously or never took place at all. And honestly, we, we can't know because the ATP has been so quiet. Um, I almost wish they would say, hey guys, hey guys, I know it's been a while, uh, bear with us. Just literally anything. Yeah, that's not happening. No, <laughs> obviously not. What's your third item to look out for? My third is look out for the unretirement of a slam winner. At least one. Well, you really went out on a limb with a couple of these, didn't you? <laughs> are you saying that those are obvious? Well, I mean, I feel like these happen all... The, the unretirements have been happening a mile a minute. Yeah, and I'm not talking about like a return, like Kerber having a baby oh, no, coming no. back. I'm talking about a legit unretirement. Like when Kim announced that she was coming back, yes. that type of thing. Mm. The third thing for me to keep an eye out for in 2023 is whether Rafa's streak of 900 plus weeks in the top 10 is broken. <sighs> He first entered the top 10 on April 25th, 2005. That is almost 18 years ago, when he was 18 years old. He has spent half his life as a top 10 ATP player, <laughs> consecutively. Like, that is absurd. Mm. And this is a man who's managed to do it while suffering long stretches of being off tour due to injury. Yeah. But why I think this is something to look at here is that he's had um, a not so great last six months, mostly, if not exclusively, due to injury. And he's back. And his trouble right now is that the start to his year last year was the best of his career. Bar none. Right. Just like the best of his career. He won a tournament to start, whereas this year he loses both of his matches at United Cup. He goes on to win the Australian Open. He wins in Mexico, I believe. Yep. Makes the final in Indian Wells. Wins Roland Garros. Granted, he didn't accumulate as many points as he normally does in the clay court swing. But, you know, those are some massive points there that are pretty much the entirety of his ranking points at this point. And so if he isn't able to, to win at a decent clip in the first five months of the season, this streak is in jeopardy. Right. If he manages to stay healthy uh, or fight against these injuries, at least, he has so much ground to make up for mm -hmm. in the second half of the year. And, of course, there's Wimbledon points as well, but everybody will be getting Wimbledon points. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. That's an interesting one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and next, let's talk about the first event of the season. And I'm going to let you drive here because I have been uh, not totally into it. Uh, United <laughs> Cup. The first question here for me is, uh, is there a bigger tennis Nepo baby than Petros Tsitsipas? I mean, this is, this is timely, right? The whole Nepo baby discourse is everywhere. Yes. These New days. New York Magazine Vulture just released this blockbuster uh, series of stories about Nepo babies in Hollywood. It was fascinating and it's fun and people love to talk mm -hmm. about it. And a lot of the Nepo babies were in their feelings. Like, it's not a difficult concept to grasp. No, like, it. this is such an easy question to answer for me. Like, if I were on a pageant and were asked this question, I feel I could nail it. Be, <laughs> be like Jane Fonda. Acknowledge that you've been given immense privilege. You're Henry Fonda's daughter. You're Hollywood royalty. And then say, 
I, I was given so many opportunities for free, and I feel like I did a good job with them. This is so easy. And as Alison Williams said, somebody who also handled it well, it doesn't mean that I didn't work hard, that my work isn't good. Mm -hmm. It just means that I had an easier time getting to those opportunities. Exactly. What is so difficult about that? Jamie Lee Curtis, who's become one of the most beloved figures in Hollywood over the past few years, really kind of fumbled this one and said the, you know, the conversation itself is mean and meant to belittle. And I would just say, you're the daughter of Janet Lee and Tony Curtis, and you also happen to be talented. Mm -hmm. You can be both. So just say you had a foot in the door from birth. Right. Alison Williams said, you know, it probably means that people won't root for me as much. And that right? that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Like, I am so sorry. Like, uh, is your bank account still fat? Are you still getting rolls? <laughs> Maybe it's better that you don't have that limelight. It's not always yeah. good. But here we are, applying this uh, lens to tennis. And Team Greece shows up with Apostolos as the team coach. Everywhere. He's just everywhere. <laughs> and then Petros leading the team out as the captain, imparting what knowledge? I don't know. I I um You love I have to, nothing to say. You love to pick on Petros. But tennis for a sport, and sports love to say that they're merit based, mm-hmm. that they're meritocracies. Tennis has a shocking level of nepotism in broadcasting, in wild cards uh, in tournament ownership, the it is unbridled. Mm-hmm. This tournament, every day they walk out together. They do the national anthems at the start of each day's play, which barf. Then they shake each other's hands and then they go to each other's corners. It's just so sprawling and opaque. It's The rules are unclear. I, I read through them at least a few times, and I'm no dummy, but it took me a while to understand what were the city finals and what were the semifinals and what is going on. Yeah, I'm confused. Well, I... to be fair, you never really made the effort to <laughs> <laughs> to clarify things for yourself. Right. I think, okay, well, I said I'd let you drive, so you go on and, and then I'll add my two cents. I don't have super strong opinions about this tournament other than... I don't like that it has replaced quite a bit of the lead-up tournaments. Like, the Brisbane tournament is not there. Mm -hmm. The pre-COVID Australian summer is nowhere to be found, essentially. And I don't know that this is something that should occupy such a huge spot in the calendar. The sprawling nature of it, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I, I get why it's appealing, especially to the top players. If you have a good team... If you're an inform Rafa Nadal and you have an inform Muguruza or Badosa and you can just steamroll guaranteed two points every tie and you know you're probably going to make it to the semifinals, that's great preparation. You get to play top players right from the jump, get tested right away multiple times, have a day's break in between matches, not having to play consecutive days. Apparently they treat them like kings and queens as well with this tournament. Oh, I'm sure. Tennis Australia is known for that. Yeah, so there's appeal there. The The lesser ranked players, they get exposure. They get to live this life that they probably never experienced before on tour. Mm-hmm. It just needs to be smaller. Or if not, it needs to have still more tournaments running concurrently. Yes. To me, the teams are too big. Yes, the, it's given big opportunities to players you've never heard of, who've never been in the spotlight, but the teams are too big. With team competitions like this, I always push back at the seriousness of it all. It should be fun. Yeah. It doesn't need, like... Like, this is not Davis Cup. This is not Billie Jean King Cup. What are you doing marching out there like you're the military before each day's play? That is completely absurd to me. The whole thing is manufactured. And I know one of your big issues with this thing is, why should I care? What is the import of this tournament? Because that is, for the... The long-term success of it, yeah, you need to have people coming, but you need to have people watching. And so you have to sell it. Mm -hmm. And so is it a hit and giggle, kiki kaka kind of thing, (laughs) which a lot of people enjoy, we do as well? 
Or are you going to go the opposite route, the complete other end of the spectrum, and trying to make it super serious? Like you're trying yeah. to replicate decades of built-in history of the Davis Cup. We already have that. We don't need that. Mm-hmm. So if it's like a hit and giggle like Hopman Cup, that's okay. I think the tournament just needs to... I mean, this could work itself out over the next few years. It just needs to be branded better. The The question about why should I care, that should be the easiest thing in the world to answer. You know, this like otherwise you don't really have a marketable product. A customer, any fan should be able to look at this thing. Should I buy a ticket? Why do I care? Is it going to be fun? Is it going to be important? Like what's what are the three main themes I can pull from this tournament? And they, to me, that's not clear. They should also be able to clearly and easily understand the rules and how it works, what the stakes are. I'll tell you the thing that I uh, disliked most about watching the United Cup. The coaches. We don't need them. The majority of these players show up with their personal coach. So we don't need a team coach. If you want to have one, have one for the lower ranked players. Because they may not have a coach themselves. Or make it like a collective group effort whereby the coaches of the top players have to then lend their resources to the younger people as well. I don't need... To have Tim Henman out here, yappa, yappa, yappa the whole time, standing up. <laughs> good job, good job, well played, well played, keep going. Duh, duh, duh. Like, the constant, the con- like, that's all you can hear. It's the noise pollution, and it was the same problem at the U.S. Open. It's too much noise. Maybe it's because I was sick, and I was more irritable. No, it but was... But I'm just like, why is there so much extraneous noise? Like, don't you have, like, Camilla's dinner party to, to attend or something? Like, why are you here? <laughs> It was, uh, and then say nothing of Leighton Hewitt. I I hope that his son doesn't become a professional tennis player because I cannot deal with his mug for another 30 years. Leighton will be hanging on regardless. Like, why is this his entire identity? My fervent wish for 2023 is for me to see and especially hear less from tennis coaches. Keep it cute. Have a press conference here or there. Have people ask you questions. But I don't need this cult of personality from coaches anymore. Mm-hmm. Nor do I find it interesting to have this event and outside of Radvanska being able to see her again, like the rest of them can go. Yeah, like you're not Jose Mourinho. <laughs> News from the Nadal camp. Rafa has uh, parted ways with Francisco Roig. Or should I say Roig parted ways with the Nadal team. Mm-hmm. He's been with Rafa, according to Rafa, since he was a child. At least since 2005, when Rafa became a major force on the professional tour. Francisco's been there. He's a very recognizable face in the box. Everybody knows his face, even if they mm. don't know his name. You said to me when this happened, well, what, who's, what's going to happen? Who's going to replace him? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is, this is a professional outfit here. The same thing happened when Tony left. Somebody stepped mm-hmm. up. Like, it's a pipeline from the academy, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> right. And so we I, have this new guy coming in to fill the third slot. I guess Mark Lopez gets bumped up a peg to number two. <laughs> and we get a full understanding of a story that we were kind of following last year when Francisco Roig was training with Sloane Stevens for a bit. And we were like, what's going on yeah. here? So Sloane further entrenches into the Spanish-speaking world. She's already the, <laughs> the queen of Mexico, WTA Mexico. And Listen, if she's not able to get the Spanish going at this point, then she's beyond help. <laughs> but this is really exciting, I think. Francisco, even though he's been part of a team of coaches on the Nadal camp for years, is one of tennis's most decorated coaches, if you think about it. Uh, he shares that title with other people from Nadal's team. But Sloane has gained a major coup, I think. And I think it shows that she's really serious about keeping this career going, and still doing big things. Mm -hmm. Roig's replacement is Gustavo Marcaccio, and he will, quote, join the technical team, having previously been a staff member at the Rafa Nadal Academy. At first I thought maybe this was the kind of the gradual shedding, um, just reducing Rafa's team as he gets ready to retire. Oh my god, you're on this beat. (laughs) I need you to leave this beat alone. Well, you know, major (laughs) figures in Rafa's team have left, and I don't know, I thought maybe... And he's won slams without them. He's sort of setting them free. (laughs) No, I mean, they want to do other things. Yeah, yeah. 
there's other tennis happening right now. There's two Adelaide tournaments going on. Well, no, there's Adelaide 1, which has the men and the women. Then there's Auckland. Of particular note to this podcast is the return of Miss Venus Ebony Star Williams. She's 42 years old. She took a wild card into Auckland. She took a wild card to play the Australian Open. And it seems that she's giving 2023 a full go. And we saw countless videos of her practicing in the offseason. And boy, did it show in her first match. And it was a cute 7-6-6-2 win over Katie Valinets. And let me tell you, Venus looked good. So good. Like, a Venus playing like that, entirely conceivable that with good health, should be a top 100 player by the end of the year. Easily. And what was different about this Venus than the previous times we've seen her in recent years is that A, she wasn't strapped at all. She looked healthy. And her ground game was so reliable. Previously, we'd see spurts of what people would say, you know, vintage Venus. Mm -hmm. She still had the powerful ground strokes when she needed it. But she was also fully committed and intent on staying the course on every rally. She wasn't trying to win rallies too soon. If she had to stretch out wide to the forehand, chip a slice backhand to get back into the point. So many times when she was on the defensive, she would hit a very effective high looping topspin shot to get back in the point. Somebody like Katie Valinets, who isn't very accomplished at net, wasn't comfortable with taking the ball out of the year and finishing at the net. That, that helped Venus in this match. But still, there was none of the, oh, that ball is a little bit too far for me to get to. I'm going to conserve energy. No, mm -hmm. this was full throttle Venus, but smart, conserving energy, deploying strategy to keep herself in the points knowing that she will get the kill shot eventually. I mean, it was just so much fun to watch. It seems like she's really given herself an opportunity to heal from some of, some of these nagging chronic injuries that she's had over the past few years. She invested a lot of time getting fit and hitting on the tennis court in the offseason, and it really shows. Over the past few years, it seemed that Venus hasn't trusted her fitness, as you were suggesting, like... She would try to bail out of points early with some big forehand and just really in the wrong position to hit a lot of these shots. And you didn't, as a fan, you didn't trust that if the point went to four or five shots that she she was going to win it. Mm -hmm. well, unfortunately for her, she came within four points of making her first WTA quarterfinal since Cincinnati 2019. She was up 5-3, then 5-4 serving for the match in the third set against Zhu Lin and wasn't able to get it done. It seemed, unfortunately, at the end of that match that perhaps she may have injured herself. She seemed to be favoring a hamstring in the last couple games of that match, and I hope that that's not the case. But when it came down to that five-all game in the third set where she had multiple break points, got a bit unfortunate in spots, but also we saw a return of the timid play. When mm. things get really, really tight... The nerves come into play for Venus, which is also a feature of her game in the last few years. And what makes me think that the injury was an actual thing is that in that last service game, she was just spinning the ball in on serve. Hmm. I mean, I suppose you could make the argument that it was an extreme case of nerves, but I, for how often she was doing it, I don't think that that was the case. Or just being really careful and really conservative in case it was an injury that she didn't want to make worse. I don't know. That's speculation. Mm. But if she is still healthy, this was a super positive start to her 2023 campaign and augurs well for the Australian Open. Granted, a decent draw. <laughs> yes. You know, Venus always says that she loves her job. She's still out here. She's not going nowhere. To take a TikTok, me TikTok meme from Nicki Minaj. Uh... But, must, must we do that on the show? I, I rebuke just, that. It is such a good sound, though. But the fact is, Venus is 42. And these match wins are... These are big. She hasn't won a singles match on a main draw since 2021 Wimbledon. 
That's prior a year and to a this half. tournament. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so fingers crossed for good health for her and that she is not injured. But that was a, a, a big highlight of 2023 so far. I'm tired of talking, so you take this, okay. n- take this next bit. At the end of last year, we were still technically in season, but we didn't talk about it. A French doubles player named Fabien Rebou posted a picture on Instagram of himself, uh, I guess, nearly kissing his uh, his colleague Maxence Brovi. You wanted to say partner, but <laughs> it is actually his doubles partner, but it was meant for us to believe that it was his yeah. actual partner. Sorry, I think his last name is Brovier. The photo was captioned with, quote, I did not fall in love with you. Your love pushed me to it. And a number of people, including some major publications, jumped on this and said it a- appears that a professional male tennis player has come out. Now, I was very hesitant to believe this because I know straight men are absolutely crazy and sick and make shit up all the time because they think it's hilarious. Now, we still don't know if this was true or not, but it's becoming more and more likely that this was a joke. An attempt at a joke. Right. I'm not saying that it was funny. It and did. it's it's something that we've seen in other sports as well. Yeah. A few months before that, uh, Iker Casillas, who, you know, is like a Spanish legend who won a World Cup with Spain, uh, p- supposedly came out on Twitter saying, quote, I hope I'll be respected. I'm gay. And Carles Puyol replied saying, it's time to tell them about us. Ha 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 ha. Hilarious. It was obviously a joke. Casillas claimed that he was hacked. Puyol admitted that uh, his part of it was a, quote, clumsy joke. I think we need to uh, abandon the the hacking excuse. Mm -hmm. This was a stupid homophobic joke in a sport that has a fandom that is incredibly homophobic. Anytime a major footballer tweets something even remotely positive about the LGBTQ community, just look at the replies. It is garbage. Poison. The other thing that leads me to believe that this was not legitimate is the fact that we do not have and have never had active out gay male tennis players. And anybody who is in the position to come out and be the first, this is something that's going to be handled. And when I say handled, I mean professionally handled. There's going to be a path charted for it. Yes, you and, will make money. Right. And if, you know, this was just an off-the-cuff, well, I can't hide this anymore, it would have been dealt with professionally subsequent to that. So the the silence in the aftermath of this is just leading me to believe that this is yet another disappointing moment where straight men are acting a fool and playing in our faces and thinking that our lives are a joke. Exactly. Like, you may think we're overreacting, but to me, it's you're telling me you think that my life, who I love, is funny to you. It's not serious. That our lives are worth joking about. It's dehumanizing. As you said on one of our year-end episodes, or maybe it would have been the pop culture episode, being gay is fun. Like, I get it. Why you'd want to be a part of that. (laughs) But there's a lot that goes along with it as well that's not so nice. Right, right. And by you making light of the situation, you're you're making it even more difficult for the first would-be out gay male tennis player. Exactly. Like, how stupid are you? Very. That's the answer. That was probably rhetorical. Mm. Now, Taylor Fritz was asked uh, about, you know, why are there no openly gay male tennis players on the ATP tour? And he gave a pretty thorough response. This was on video. He said, I'm not sure if there are homosexual tennis players in the top 100. Uh, This is an editor's note. Why do people say homosexual? (laughs) It It really (laughs) makes me laugh. Like, it's not it's not offensive to me, but I I feel that straight men sometimes think they're using like the most scientific word. The technically (laughs) acceptable term. You can almost hear them stumble over it slowly, right? Like they've cycled through five different words they're like, well, I'm not going to use the F one. Definitely not going to use that no, one. No, not that. One. And then they, <laughs> and within those split seconds, those two seconds, they land on homosexual. I've heard it so many times, like to my face too. I'm, I'm just poking fun. Like it's just funny to me. Anyway, Taylor went on to say, maybe people think behind closed doors we know or something. Statistically speaking, there should be. 
statistically, but not that I know of. He goes on to say, I think it's odd because I feel like a player would be accepted. Myself and my friends, other players on tour wouldn't have any issues with it. It would be totally normal, and I think people would be accepting. I can't tell you why. Obviously, any time, that would be a lot of big news, and maybe people just don't want to be in the spotlight. Maybe they don't want the distraction of getting all the attention and stuff like that. To his first point, I think it's great that Taylor and his friends would be accepting. That's wonderful to hear. What I don't really buy is, like, not understanding why people would be afraid. Because, of course, you've just had a professional tennis player potentially make fun of a gay relationship, right? right? There's, you know, in Felix's gay survey, so <laughs> a player said they've heard plenty of, uh, the majority of respondents said, I've heard gay slurs in the locker room all the time, and I'd like it to stop, but it happens. Right. It creates an inhospitable and scary atmosphere right. for closeted players. And when Taylor says, you know, me or my friends, you know, we're all good, we got no problems with the homosexuals. Well, what are the things that you're saying to push back against that talk in the locker room? Right. And I think it's great and it's important for him to say this mm -hmm. and like credit where it's due. But, you know, I think all of us kind of have to look at our behavior and see, well, what am I doing mm -hmm. to, to make things more welcoming? Like it's 2022. Like this is not gold medal type stuff. To just say, well, I think, you know, like, it's so weird, we're, we're at the right? point in society, I think, where we absolutely should be expecting more action than words. Like, that's the stuff that's commendable, mm -hmm. you know? I guess because we do sort of live in a bubble, I feel like I live in such a gay place that this conversation is so, like, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And I know that not everyone lives in a in a culture or even a city or town like that that were privileged, but a lot of tennis players like grew up in the Western world with extreme privilege and like this would be normal to them. No, tennis is absolutely behind the majority of other sports. We have the NBA, we have Dwayne Wade out here being a champion for everybody in the alphabet. We right. have... But see... We even have soccer stars. People in soccer, like as much as it's super homophobic, mm -hmm. there have been people who are out. There have been people who have been speaking to this stuff and being allies publicly. Pretty much every sport. Carl Nassib in the NFL, out, active, playing in the NFL. For all the millions of reasons why the NFL is complete and utter gully gutter trash, getting the NFL to contribute to the Tre Trevor Project. <laughs> or um, maybe I misspoke, maybe the Oakland Raiders or whichever team mm -hmm. he was with matching his donation or something. There are these micro conversations that are happening by professional athletes in other professional sports right, that but... we're not having at all, like zero in tennis. And it's like, how many years since we asked Roger Federer in press his thoughts on this? Mm. Like we get like maybe once or twice a year, the same question with the same kind of response and nothing further. Like we get this alleged survey, beat the ATPs or Felixes or whatever, and we get pretty disturbing results from it. And nothing further, <laughs> you know? I uh, I guess it is technically possible that there are just no gays. I mean, it's that just, is absolutely possible. It's just uh, highly unlikely. But to counter what you were saying, you mentioned uh, United States-centered leagues and federations, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that is one culture out of the many that tennis is comprised of. Yeah. And there are a lot of countries where people play tennis where... This is not okay, right? And and people grow up with a lot of different ideas and exposure because tennis players are coming from all over the world. It's not okay in a lot of the states within the United States. No, that's true. Taylor's second point, though, about a gay player potentially being hesitant to come out because of the spotlight and the attention and the consequential loss of focus and concentration on one's career, I think that's a good point. Because there could be gay players who don't even think of themselves as closeted, just don't want to come out in the traditional sense because they don't want that to be their entire life. Mm -hmm. It's a lot, right? Like, look at... Especially in a sport like tennis where you bear the full brunt of your career if you're not a top player. We got word a couple of days ago, I think, that the U.S. has extended its ban on unvaccinated travelers which now leaves Novak's Sunshine Swing uh, travels 
and participation in doubt again. Yeah, I love how it's being reported as in doubt. Can we just move on? Joe Biden just said it's not going to happen. <laughs> he could not have been more unequivocal. So let's not talk about it anymore. Mm-hmm. No, but folks are like, oh, this isn't fair. At this point in the pandemic, it's just not fair. Like, and for me personally, none of the pandemic was fair to me. Indeed. Until billions of people around the world. Indeed not. So I certainly cannot bother to give a solitary fuck about whether a tennis player can play in the United States. Regardless of who it is. Especially because it's Djokovic. For me, personally, after what we went through last mm-hmm. year. Don't care. Now, if you want to talk about the morality of immigration and travel visas, that's a different thing. We have talked about that. (laughs) Yes. Your favorite part of the agenda, one that I will be having to fight with you tooth and nail throughout the course of this season, this season nine Mm -hmm. of The Body Serve. I already told you I was not watching Breakpoint. Is that what it's called? It's called Breakpoint. The most basic title I can think of. Mm -hmm. The Netflix series about tennis which is generating drama and intrigue about something that already happened. Fascinating. And fascinating. Will... Fascinating that you're being completely obtuse about the <laughs> fact that this is designed to attract fans to the sport who do not really know tennis. That's it true. is not made for you, James. That's true. But tennis Twitter will stay winning as far as engagement. Sure. They will slay the competition. You said you weren't touching this at all, but yet I still got you to watch the trailer today. It was 90 seconds. Yeah, I did watch it. Mm -hmm. And your thoughts. And don't tell me you don't have thoughts. Uh, Beautiful gowns. (laughs) Oh, lordy, lord, lord. We have a listenership that is probably expecting us to talk about this stuff. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I do not want to get the reputation of the tennis podcaster who doesn't like tennis. That hasn't happened already? Definitely don't want that. (laughs) Although I do think it would be a novel... uh, contribution to the genre Mm. so how this is going to work is that on january something (laughs) some wow something something like january 13 news reporting january teens somewhere around there the first five episodes of this series is going to come five it's not all it's not one at a time no they release in two batches oh jesus lord oh my god they release two batches the first batch the first big batch Mid-January, and they'll have five episodes, each highlighting two specific players. And then in June, I want to say, the next big batch is coming with episodes six through ten. So how this is going to work is that the first episode is going to focus on Kyrgios and Kokinakis, which will be a trial and a tribulation to get through. Not just for me, but to actually force you to watch it, because I'm going to make you watch it. Mm-hmm. The second one is Matteo Bertini and Isla Tomlanovic. Interesting. Interesting. Because they've since broken up. Well, could have been. I'm, you know, I understand that they're trying to position this as who's going to take the mantle from these legends. Tennis is transitioning. We need new stars. I get it. Did they even have the choice of doing something else? Would the big stars have played along for well, another narrative? They don't have to. I don't think so. Exactly. The third episode is Zachary and Taylor Fritz. The fourth episode, Jabur and Badosa. And the fifth, Kasparud and Felix. Now, they've created these narratives for these episodes. The first one, obviously, is going to cover Australian Open. One of the episodes is going to cover Indian Wells. I assume that that's the third one, Zachary and Taylor Fritz. Fritz, who beat Nadal in the final, and Zachary, who lost in the final to Iga. The fourth one, Jabur and Badosa. For Madrid, I'm assuming. And then the French Open one, which is episode five, will feature Kasparud and Felix. And so you look at the cast of characters, you look at what tournaments will be covered, and you kind of kind of guess what the narrative is going to be like. And the thing that I'm really looking forward to least is this first one. Because Kyrgios is already out here, bigging up himself, reveling in him being front and center of this episode. He went on Twitter and said, ha 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 ha. So after all this, all the media, journalism saying how bad I am for the sport, disrespecting the game, and just a pure villain, I am going to be the number one episode on Netflix to grow our fan base, basically trying to put tennis on the map again. We, I cannot express to you how tired we are. 
I am at a loss with this dude at this point. And the thing that's most frustrating for me is that Netflix has now given him a platform after the fact. They could have still decided to edit it differently after it was shot. But if this was decided from way back in January, when he and Kokonakis won the doubles title, that we're going to take this focus, they have now, since those allegations have come out against Nick Kyrgios, put him in a position to be redeemed by this show. Did you see in the trailer there were several consecutive scenes of him loving up on his girlfriend? Oh, yeah. 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 Interesting. And a scene of him, like, hunched over saying something about the pressure of being expected to be the next big thing and somebody on Twitter being like, dude, you're 30. <laughs> like, honestly, that, sh- that ship has sailed. He's not 30. Uh, but no, but the ship has sailed. Nobody's expecting that from him now. Meryl Streep, Screen Actors Guild Award. Give it to him right now. It is... Uh, mm-hmm. I quite literally don't have the energy at this moment, but I do think we do need to talk about this this type of personality that actually is very, very appealing to a large group of people, especially uh, a huge segment of young men, which is something I think we need to be very concerned about. I know a lot of parents who have said that their sons kind of waded through that kind of men's rights activist, Andrew Tate, misogynistic icon, mm-hmm. uh, and some of them didn't make it through. But the young men are being exposed to this sort of thing. And I know it's not all the same. Like, you know, incel is not the same as whatever, Trump supporter, whatever. But there are uh, threads. Yeah, to be that, clear, you're not saying that Kyrgios is a Trump supporter. No, but I'm saying, saying that, that this is the fam- family of This behavior. type of male personality uh, is something that we really need to take seriously over the next generation. Because it, it actually is very appealing to a lot of young men. In other news, Boris Becker has been released early from prison and deported. The United Another States. January with a deportation. Well, he was let go in December, actually, in time for Christmas, right? I don't know. It, that doesn't fit my narrative here that I'm trying to, <laughs> to make. Yes. Happen. The United Kingdom said, you know what, just go home. But you can't come back. He was allowed to go back to Germany. And guess what? <laughs> He'll be doing Australian Open commentary for Eurosport. Tennis has no standards. Zero. Not even like, well, let's let's keep him at bay for a little bit. <laughs> let's wait till Wimbledon. <laughs> it's been pretty much a universal welcome Boris back to the fold. Prominent people in tennis couldn't wait to tweet support welcoming him back to the fold once it was announced that he was being released. It's so odd. I mean, I don't really need him to be shunned. I really don't care about his crimes. They're not that important to me. Uh, It's just weird. Simona Halep is still under a provisional suspension for testing positive for this drug called Roxadustat. I think that's how you say it. She has requested an emergency hearing with the ITIA, which is the Tennis Integrity Agency, which handles doping issues. Uh, A few Romanian publications... The one I read was called Capital, reported uh, that a Romanian judge with the Court of Arbitration for Sport named Cristian Iura has claimed publicly that Simona has a solid defense and she can explain exactly how the drug entered her system. Now, this judge has been very vocal, has divulged quite a bit. This is very surprising to me that a judge would be so open about an ongoing investigation. But uh, supposedly, the Halep defense is that Roxadustat entered her system through a contaminated supplement from a French lab. Uh, the drug is actually currently legal in France. And this is, you know, it's a defense that we've heard before. Uh, it's a defense that has been effective before. But it is a, it's, a, it's a tall mountain to climb to completely clear your name, to completely overturn a ban like this. Halep has to prove, first, how the substance entered her body, and that's going to require a lot of documentation, uh, reports from labs, from doctors. She'll have to prove that the ingestion was unintentional. And finally, and to me I think this is the biggest one, is that she was not negligent in allowing this drug to enter her system. So, Christian Jura is confident that Simona is going to clear her name completely, get this ban overturned, 
But there are, you know, there are a lot of steps before we get to that. In the meantime, she will not play the Australian Open, and we'll we'll see. We are at the part of a season preview episode where we list our breakout candidates for the upcoming season. And how we do it is that we pick three ATP players and three WTA players, one each from the 50 and ranked higher bracket, one from the 51 to 100 bracket, and one from the 100 plus bracket. And I do want to clarify here that this is not necessarily just a young and up and coming player. Like in the past, last year, I picked Andy Murray. Okay, good. So I did it right. <laughs> I suspect we're going to have the exact same ones. Really? So I'm just going to go first. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> go. You go. On the ATP side, top 50, I'm going to go with Jack Draper. Okay. Folks seem to be having a lot of trouble with his boom, boom, lefty game. From the 51 to 100 range, I have three players here, but I'm only going to choose two. Okay. I know the popular pick for a lot of folks is going to be Ben Shelton. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Yuri Lechka and Jason Kubler. I watched Jason Kubler play Francis Tiafo. I want to say on grandstand at the U.S. Open at night, and I enjoyed it. And he's fun to look at. Somebody who's okay. had a lot of injuries in his career, and he, I believe, won two matches at United Cup. Watched him quite a bit this week as well. And in the 100 plus bracket, I'm going to go with Stan Wawrinka. I choose Stan because he's got Magnus back in his corner. He's had a decent results to end the year last year, and then came out blazing in his first match in United Cup looked amazing then lost in straight sets to Ubi Orkac in the second mm -hmm. but I think he's got one really good run left in him all right great picks I love the picks you're there always was, so supportive with there this. was a little overlap but actually not much top 50 I'm gonna go again second year in a row with again Alejandro Davidovich Fokina oh you are I'm a believer you are an ADF truther i am you know animal lovers we have to keep them close so and why aren't you a fan of dennis Shapovalov? the only reason that i haven't pushed him off a cliff what? is, the, is <laughs> that dennis loves animals <laughs> 51 to 100 this is the overlap i, I picked yuri lehechka as well okay he was the i think the runner-up at next gen last year right to Brandon nakashima and then in the 100 plus i have two uh, one is similar it's a resurgent veteran dominic team i think isn't he top 100 right now not in the official rankings. Oh, okay maybe in the live rankings okay not i use the official atp okay. rankings. and my other choice is zizu bergs okay i can't pronounce his last name i heard i heard him pronounce it uh, he's belgian it's very difficult um but that's not it on the wta side top 50 i'm going with queen wen <laughs> <laughs> zhong chin wen well, can't miss. She took a beating last night from Victoria Azarenka, though. Oh. Like, I mean, Chinwen had something like 32 winners to 14 unforced errors and still lost 6 to 7 5 or something like that. <laughs> Vika was on one last night against well, her. You know, Vika does this every once in a while. 51 to 100. I'm going with Alicia Parks. Again. I am riding that train that is going full steam ahead right now. The other popular pick, I'm going to give two. We allow ourselves that, yep. right? Room yep. for error. We've already done that. I'm going to go with Linda Fruvitova. Everybody's going to pick Miss Linda. Yeah, that's that's a pretty obvious one. And then the 100 plus, one of my faves, hoping for a big comeback from Karolina Mukhova. And then also... <laughs> very popular among our listeners as well. Yes. She's only 15, so I'm not going to officially pick this person but i do find it interesting that little miss sunshine brenda for little sis <laughs> is <laughs> just like on the cusp of the top 100 as you know and then there's noskova there's so many czech all, all these lindas teenagers the lindas are coming girl czech women's tennis mm -hmm. is about to be lit no i mean for the next 50 years the bench is deep like czech women's tennis will last throughout the next ice age it's crazy like you blink and another one's coming <laughs> who did you pick uh so for the top 50 i picked uh babs for a return to the top 10 
Okay. Krejcikova. Okay. Because of what we saw in Ostrava. I'm here. The necklace is fused. It's been put back together, and I'm a, I'm along for the ride. Uh, 51 to 100, Yulin E. Meyer. Okay. Quarterfinalist at yeah. Wimbledon. Maybe she'll do the same thing and earn points next year. I was tempted to go with her, but then I the two losses at United Cup. Mm. Kind of... Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a stupid reason to not pick her. Well, <laughs> frankly. Rafa lost two matches at the United <laughs> Cup, so <laughs> tread lightly. Um, but yeah, obviously a lot of talent. And then above 100, I've got Diane Perry and also the return of Karolina Mukhova. Okay. The last two bits to get through on the agenda. The final question we asked each other, and we opened it up to... Uh, listeners on Twitter to get their responses as well is what are your hopes for the 2023 season your biggest wishes etc and then we'll finish with giving you the answer to the name the tennis player I kept it cute at just four okay uh, for my hopes for the 2023 season as is the case every year I wish for number 50 for Venus her 50th title singles title of her career I'm hoping for a return to form for Ms. Kennan, Mm -hmm. who looked really good for the most part against Coco Goff last night. She won her first match in Auckland, pushed Coco last night. All is not lost. I hope. I hope for 2023 that Naomi Osaka disassociates from Nick Kyrgios. (laughs) Today we got news that Ons Jabeur has joined Naomi's management team what is it called evolve evolve or something like that evolve um that she founded with her prior agent Stuart dugid i guess they're partners in this venture now their first big tennis signing was nick curios and they're off like courting pickleball and becoming like pickleball conglomerates (laughs) it's just all disgusting Uh, that whole partnership getting sued over cryptocurrency you know as one does and so I would, I'd like to see less of that. One of the big listener responses to this question was that Naomi will return to the court and be happy on court. That's not one of my explicit hopes for this segment because I'm at the point where Naomi should do what's good for Naomi. If that's tennis for her, that's good for me. Like, I'm I'm not personally invested in it. I am... Happy if she shows up and plays well, I'll watch her and enjoy it. I have no more stakes in an up-and-coming tennis player to be a great. <laughs> you know, that ship has yeah, sailed. Yeah, like we've, we've done it. Yeah, we've those watched. stakes are gone for me as a, a fan. And so I will just enjoy who's here when they're here. And right now it doesn't seem like Naomi wants to be here, and that's fine for me. But I would like her associates to be more on the up-and-up. So where are we at here? Oh, I have one more. Okay. I would like number 15 for Rafa Nadal. At the French Open. <laughs> Nothing more needs to be said mm-hmm. about that. Okay, I'm going to give mine without uh, editorializing. I'm just going to blow through them here. Is that shade? No. Okay. No, I'm just, uh, you know, in an audit- oral medium, I want people to like, be able to follow it. Okay. My hopes for the tennis season coming up are, uh, number one, that Serena isn't done. Are you serious? Number two, that Jabour and Oje Aliasim win their first slams, that Iga Svantec gets a true rival or rivals. Uh, number four, that tennis establishes clear, consistent policies and procedures about domestic violence and safeguarding vulnerable people from abuse and exploitation. And five, that certain people have the year they deserve. Wow, I can think of a lot of people. One just popped to mind that I wouldn't even dare say on this show. Not what? a tennis player. Well, <laughs> well, not anymore. Is this someone in your personal life? Or... <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, th- those are my hopes. You really think that Miss Williams could come back? It's not a prediction, it's a hope. You want to go through that again? I would. I, you know, <laughs> okay. I, we've suffered and, and we'll do it again. All right, let's get through some of the submissions. There, you know, we had a lot of commonalities with mm-hmm. with uh, listener feedback. Dan Spirational on Twitter said, 
Berrettini and Jabour at the Wimbledon Ball as champions. What a vision. Damien Turbler, a late submission, says, definitely a happy Naomi on the court. 2022 Miami was great because even though she lost in the final, she competed like a champ against Bencic and seemed proud of herself for getting that win. You know, I want to add one more thing to look out for in 2023. This was the question at the top of the episode. Can would, Will we find ourselves in a situation where yet another young player comes out of nowhere and clips the wings of those who would be the presumed next slam champions? I think mm-hmm. right now we're expecting it to be Sabalenka, Jabor as first-time champions. We've seen it where somebody like Belinda Bencic was just completely eclipsed. Mm-hmm. As, you know, she was the one that was supposed to be coming. And she's just been coming for a long time and being passed by by a lot of people. And I think that that's, that's something to look forward to. Are we going to get just a, a further stability at the top of the women's game? Sure, Iga is a cut and above. And I still think she is. Mm-hmm. And it's still only, what, 21 will get better. <laughs> right. And wants to get better. She literally could have a more dominant year than last year. Yeah. Like, but if if we are to get those top 10 players building Jabor, you know, winning a slam after making two finals, Sabalenka after like really trying and trying and trying and trying, getting it done, are we getting that solidification or are we going to get new people, a new cast of characters just eclipsing them? Mm-hmm. And then, great, we have a top 100 where anybody could win any given week, you know? Right. Andre Dragomir is hoping for a top 10 for Begu. I will say, Andre is one of the most stalwart Begu fans. Mm-hmm. Bad Toss is rooting for everybody black. And you know what? Honestly, same. We had, uh, I'll kind of group these together. You know, people are hoping for slams for certain people. Sapna is hoping for slams for Coco and Ons. Uh, Bless Amy's Heart is hoping for a Sabalenka slam. A lot about women's tennis especially is wishing for resurgence Mm -hmm. of players who have achieved massive things and have fallen off a little bit. So Shannon Clark says resurgent Andreescu, Osaka, Fernandez, Kennan. Three of those women are slam winners. Another RG for Rafa. A major title for Ons. Nadine says Andrescu back in the top five and a rivalry with Iga. Mateo winning Wimbledon and an Alcaraz repeat at the U.S. Open. A number of people, uh, including both of us, <laughs> are hoping for a Mukhova resurgence. TikTok Tennis clarified, and not just kind of a one-time flash-in-the-pan run at a major, Mukhova as a consistent top five level player, because that's what her talent demands. Ryan would like Curious to retire and for well, a Canadian slam win. <laughs> and nope. the response to that from Sharice was defund tennis camp. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, ma'am, we just met for the first time at the National Bank Open. In Canada. In Canada in August. Were you here on a reconnaissance mission? <laughs> because I will report you to the Mounties. The RCMP. Uh, wow, catching strays over here in Canada. <laughs> Leave Felix alone. <laughs> Charisse has been very clear about her attempts to defund the LTA and the USTA in and recent you know, times. I'm, I'm on board. Fully and, on board. But today, apparently, she's added Tennis Canada to the list. Well, you win some, you lose some. We've got Venus number 50 from Shannon from Ubiquitous. I know I didn't pronounce your Twitter handle correctly. We've got Venus50 from Game Set Match 11. From Tennis underscore John. Everybody wants it. Kieran is hoping for Dominic Team in the second week of at least one major. I think he's he's putting in the work. You know, I love this one because this is such a low bar for Dominic Team. For Dominic, it is. <laughs> it is. Like... And I, I love that the expectations and the hopes are not too high for him. You know, like... I will take it if I get this. I I love that outlook. Gabe says more women coaching top players. Yeah, let's hear it. Both men and women. At Hoya Pinoy says Layla defending Monterey and making a splash at another slam. Hopefully 
Roland Garros. This would be a three-peat for Layla if she were to yeah. win in Monterey. Layla and Sloan really duking it out for Queen of Mexico title. Game set match 11 says Muguruza to give us something. Anything. <laughs> Venus 50, again. Zverev to disappear. Kanta and Kerber returns. Is Kanta the one that you want? Oh, well, she's not a Grand Slam champion, is she? That wouldn't qualify as one of the unretirements yeah. for you? No. <laughs> I heard that Kanta is a Tory, so sorry. Sorry about it. It really would sorry, be nice. Boris. <laughs> it would be nice for Mogarutha to give us anything at mm-hmm. this point. Let the racket talk, as she said. Let it say anything. It was not a good start against Andrescu in Adelaide. She was up six love. Well, I guess it was a good start. <laughs> she was up it, six love. It wasn't a good end. Six love, five, two. I'm telling you. And then won like maybe two more games? Bianca Bianca ha- has scam potential, right? I don't know what was going on in that match, but... There's no potential. <laughs> Bianca is a scammer. <laughs> Not a sinister scammer, maybe like a Putin Seva or a Georgie. But there's scammery happening. Like the the, the, dr- the dramaticking, mm-hmm. the pulling stuff out the hat in every match. She brings it to you every ball. This is why I think Andreescu could be an actual rival for Iga because she's got the personality. Several people have a game that could bring them there, but Andreescu just, she craves it. Milena is hoping for either RG15 or Wimbledon number three for Rafa. She has not hoped for both. Only one. <laughs> and I'll take one. Harish is hoping for justice for Peng Shui, which... You know, unfortunately, I am not very optimistic about. And we are getting reports again that the WTA is holding firm with its stance to not play in China until this is resolved. Until they mm-hmm. know that Pung is for sure safe. That they get this one-on-one with her. Because if you recall, the schedule for 2023 has only been made up until a certain point. The fall section has not been made available. Mm-hmm. And... We talked about this a lot at the end of last year, about how the WTA is in a really tough spot financially because of their moral and ethical stance on this issue. Yeah. And it seems that they have doubled down on it thus far. In 2023, we'll see how that plays out. That's another thing to keep an eye out for in 2023. And finally, Francisco Luis is pretty in line with my own hopes for the 2023 season. He said, I hope for the season to not be as heavy with foolery on our souls and more joyous with the actual game. And I might change a few words around, but it's it's the same sentiment. Here, here. Stop the foolishness. Name the tennis player. Do you want to go through the answers and let people know what's what? Sure. I'll try to remember why each thing is. Well, do you want to let them know who the player is, who the answer is first? The player is Stanislas Wawrinka. Mm-hmm. First aid. Uh, I don't. I don't know what first aid is. The Swiss flag. Oh, like like the Red Cross. Yes, it's the inverse of the colors. Mm-hmm. And apparently, the guy who founded the um, what do you call it? The first aid. The, the, Red, Cross. the Red Cross. I just said he it. was. <laughs> he was Swiss or something, and so that's where that comes from. Wow. It was intentional. So informative. He was Swiss or something. Yeah. I mean, this is the reason why I'm not lying. If you want more detail, look it up. Mm -hmm. Bear. Mm -hmm. That one is self-evident. Stan posed nude with his... Partially. With his backside out. The profile of his backside. Right. Right. Absurd. Um, I believe... Okay. So I saw some of the chatter about this on Twitter. This was the last one that people couldn't get. His tattoo is a quote from Samuel Beckett. Correct. Who is uh, an Irish writer, wrote the play Waiting for Godot, Mm -hmm. and is famous for absurdist literature. And theater of the absurd. Yes. Correct. That's where that's from. Okay. Crybaby. Mariah Carey, Rainbow. This is iconic. This is the sort of thing that Netflix should be covering when Mirka Federer heckled Stan Wawrinka at, what, the World Tour Finals? And called him a crybaby? Correct. Wow. Iconic behavior. 
And finally, plaid. I think this might actually give it away for a lot of people, is the famous, I guess, I don't know, tartan? What would you call it? Is it plaid? Those shorts that yes, he shorts. won Roland Garros with. 2015. Yeah, that was a good one. Thank you. <laughs> we have reached the end of our first episode of 2023. Again, we're going to plug the GoFundMe here because we are in the final straightaway We've got like four episodes left before we shut it down. Again, it'll be up until the end of the Australian Open. We are at 85% of our goal. You can find a link to our GoFundMe through linktree.com slash the body serve. If you go to our Twitter, you'll find stuff. Anywhere body serve related, you'll be able to track it down. Or you could just Google it. And you know what? We are still here mm -hmm. after all these years. And we're still doing it. Yes. <laughs> you, you can't get rid of us. Listen, a week ago, recording today did not seem likely at all. You know what? I was I was just happy to be able to get out of bed and take the dog outside before he had an accident. Mm -hmm. That was that was my only goal in life. So this is a huge improvement. I am amazed that I even got through this episode. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of things in the last week that we're amazed that we got through. <laughs> Thank you for listening. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. We're at The Body Serve on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us at linktree.com slash The Body Serve. Thank you for listening and uh, buckle up for 2023. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.